Okay, looks like the USB is working. There we go. Good evening, folks. Got to wait another minute or so for other people to show up, and then we'll carry on here. Got three. I suppose there may be more absences than usual on the day after holiday. But anyway, in 30 seconds, I'll start. Aha. Shopping. Yes, that's entirely possible, Al. <laughs> they may be off shopping or watching football or comatose or any number of things this time of year. All right, so we're up to the time. So last time, I didn't quite finish the previous chapter because it was kind of long and the next one was short. So this is the last bit of chapter five, uh, virtual private networks. And the goal of this is to create a secure link. Now, one very simple kind of private network that's been around for decades is to just make a long distance phone call from to work and then send your data at 56 baud but nobody much wants to do that anymore because it's expensive and slow. What you want to do is use the internet, which is cheaper and faster, but of course then your data is being shared with many people, so you have to add encryption to it in order to prevent other people from eavesdropping on you. And so the idea is to simulate having a fast line, like a T1 or faster. Uh, SLIP was one of the earliest protocols for this. It was just a transport protocol, a way to put LAN packets into a WAN packet and deliver it over the internet. PPP was another one that came after that, and this is what's mostly used by DSL lines to connect to the uh, ISP, where you just go from one point to one point. Uh, PPTP is a very common type of VPN. Microsoft has built it in their operating system since Windows XP and I think maybe Windows 2000 also. It uses, uh, it adds encryption, uses port 1723. It's not very safe. There's an offline dictionary attack that Joshua Wright called a sleep that can crack in if the uh, password for it is in a dictionary and my students do it for homework. But it is, uh, very easy to set up at the server and the client end and remains fairly popular for that reason. L2TP is another transport protocol. And let's see, I just don't know what I heard there. Oh, let me uh, mute them again. My previous mute didn't seem to take. All right, anyway, so um, L2TP is a trailer transport protocol. So by itself, it does not add any confidentiality or encryption, but it's commonly used with IPsec. And L2TP combined with IPsec forms what is generally regarded as the most secure VPN in use today. And it can transmit almost any kind of data, not just IP. So IPsec is what Bruce Schneier in one of his papers described as the most complicated encryption protocol of all. So complicated, he was not able to do a thorough analysis but he believes it's very secure and they don't know any significant attacks against it except if you use it in the weakest key distribution mode. So it has an encapsulating security payload mode and an authentication header mode. Unfortunately, both of these modes use protocols with strange numbers. They are therefore not TCP or UDP and that makes it very difficult to reach people behind home routers because most home routers uh, only to transmit UDP and TCP to the user as if that was the whole internet, and it's not. There are various other protocols beside that and use it layer four. It's just that if you use them, you make it hard for home users to connect. So host to gateway would be a client 
going to a concentrator to get to work, gateway to gateway would be point to point, and you could, in principle, go from one host to another for something like peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, I guess, although I'm not aware of anybody doing that. There's a transport mode and a tunnel mode, which is one of the things that is strange and unnecessarily complicated about IPsec. In the transport mode, you protect only the layer seven data. In the tunnel mode, you take the entire packet and put it in another packet and encrypt the whole packet, which is kind of screwy because you can't really conceal the address you're talking to at this. You have to have a real address on the outside somewhere that's not encrypted so it can be routed unless you're going through something like Tor, which is an anonymity network and is not part of a VPN per se, although it could be in principle combined with a VPN. Most people on the internet send data with TLS. Originally there was SSL, was the early version of this. All versions of SSL are now deprecated and considered unsafe, and there are TLS versions that have replaced it. Uh, TLS 1.0 and 1.1 were very popular, but because of the documents released by Edward Snowden, there was a huge fear about the NSA spying on people, and somewhat illogically, everyone jumped up to TLS 1.2 as if that was going to stop the NSA, which I kind of doubt it will. But anyway, whenever there's a security scare, everyone jumps up to improve their security. And uh, TLS 1.2 is quite common now. The main advantage of TLS 1.2 over the early protocols is perfect forward secrecy, they call it. Uh, the NSA, or the Department of Homeland Security, one of them, is, is archiving all the data from the internet in Utah in vast data storage units. And their plan is apparently that if they eventually can get the encryption key later, they can go back and decrypt historical data. And that's possible with versions of TLS before 1.2 because it uses the same key over and over. TLS 1.2 uses a different key for every message to stop that attack. Anyway, if you um, it just connects over port 443 and it's easier for the client to use because they just connect like a browser. So remote access is uh, really important. People have to access their company network from somewhere else while they're traveling. In the long ago, decades ago, people started having ISDN networks back, which was considered a step up from the uh, 56K modem that went over copper phone lines. Uh, DSL was the next step up, which is much better and still in common use, of course. You can get 10 megabits per second or even a lot more, and there are a lot of versions of it uh, with different speeds, but you know, the main determiner of the speed is how close you are to a main telephone switching station because DSL can only go through uh, something like 10,000 or 18,000 feet of copper wire before the signal degrades so much that you don't get any significant speed through it anymore. So it's really only useful for people who live in cities near major switching stations. If you are a little further out, you can use a cable modem if you are not so far in the country that you don't have cable TV. So this will reach pretty much everybody in a city or a suburb, but not people out in the country. Uh, another authentication system that people use sometimes, which is very simple, but improves security a lot, is to never let people call in to the company network. They have to call in and ask for a call back at their known phone number, and then you know who they are. Of course, this is not that useful for people who are traveling all the time. Although these days, I think what most people use is these 4G and 3G hotspots, uh, which puts you on another layer of encryption and pass you through what is essentially not a shared network. So they're really quite secure, sort of like the old days when you make a long distance phone call. Anyway, uh, another thing would be to call you back from the caller ID or to check the caller ID to verify that you're calling from the expected number, but it's easy to forge caller IDs. They are not authenticated anywhere any more than source IP addresses or source email addresses are authenticated, and this weakness in the internet leads to a whole variety of things like spam phone calls and spam email and so on. You can send something and leave no real record of where it came from. All right, if you want to be able to have um, remote control of a machine, you can use R login and RSH and old Unix systems with no encryption, those are really out of date. The modern solution for graphical desktop control is VNC for a Linux box and remote desktop protocol 
for a Windows box. Uh, they both have encryption in the modern versions and uh, RDP in particular does give you a nice graphical experience over the internet. There are third-party tools you can put on like go to my PC and log me in. One advantage of these things is you do not need to get permission to run a server at your company. Uh, they all send data to the company server, so at both ends, it appears to be outgoing internet data. Now you can block it with a layer seven firewall, and my college does, but if you have anything less than a layer seven firewall, then it's not easy to block because it just looks like normal HTTPS traffic. All right, then there's a uh, virtual desktop infrastructure. Uh, a lot of companies are switching to this where they have a thin client. You do not really have a computer to work at. You just have a screen and a typewriter and a mouse, and everything you do is actually being controlled on a server somewhere. So um, you deploy an image. Well, that's a thin client. Now, the VDI should be more careful. Typically, you do have a computer, but it's deployed uh, from the server. And application virtualization is closer to what I was talking about there, where the application lives on the server and it's not even installed locally. This is, of course, better for a lot of security features. You know that everyone's always using the latest version and all their data is stored on the server, not on an endpoint, which they might take away and lose or get malware on or something. Screen scraping is one system used to collect the information on the screen and send it over the internet. VNC does that, but not RDP. Instant messaging has been around for a long time, so people can chat with each other one-on-one. -on -one. Internet relay chat was one of the early ones. Um, it's not used by anybody except malware and criminals much anymore, except for a very few hardliners that continue to use it from the old days. Uh, AOL sent messenger came and was popular, and there was one called Jabber, and there's a lot of others. I haven't heard anybody using these much in maybe about 10 years, but they used to be all the rage. These days, I think the modern things that have replaced it are things like Slack. And then there's remote meeting, like what we're doing right now. Citrix has it. Microsoft Office has it. Cisco has their products. As you can tell, I find that Zoom is by far the best, one of the newest entries. Whenever I use other ones like uh, Cisco's remote protocol, something like 20% of the students cannot connect. It uses some goofy port or something. Zoom seems to be the most successful at actually delivering the conference to the audience. Anyway, they all work the same way. They have audio or video being sent, usually through some kind of encryption, off to people who connect. These personal digital assistants, I think, have also come and gone, and now they're replaced by the smartphone. A mobile device is probably a better term these days. Uh, for these things. And they're, of course, very important for security because people put a lot of company data on the smartphone and it gets stolen a lot, so it is an issue. And most people that have a company phone have to have it controlled by the server with a mobile device management solution so they can limit what apps you put on it and tell when it and wipe it when it gets stolen and things like that. So those are the security issues here. You should have a pin, it should have a remote wipe capability. Uh, you should use secure wireless connections and be careful using Bluetooth. There is an uh, old protocol intended for wireless applications called WAP, which is based on HTML and uses wireless transport layer security. But I was just before this lecture, I was looking it up, wondering why I've never seen anybody use this. And as far as I can tell, this has been pretty much abandoned for at least the last five years. According to Wikipedia, it was pretty much gone by 2013. I think it's another uh, system that was pretty much replaced by modern smartphones. Content delivery networks are very important. If you have a website like Yahoo or Google and people are connecting from all over the world, you can run one server and have all the people in the world come to that one server, but pretty soon you overwhelm the capability of that server. And also the people that are in another country have a, low late, have a high latency as their traffic has to spend 200 milliseconds going around the world to get to you. So it becomes much better to pay a content delivery company, which will make a copy of your website and share it from a local cache near everyone. Uh, Cloudflare does this. Akamai is the monster, the, the biggest one that people use. Amazon will do it. Azure will do it. And uh, this can increase the availability of your website 
and it can also resist DOS attacks. I know Cloudflare in particular is quite vigorous at blocking attacks. So if anybody tries to attack your server, Cloudflare blocks it, and none of that traffic actually reaches your server. So I got some cahoots about that stuff. They should be here. There we go, 125, 5B, that looks like the right one. All right. There it goes. All right. There are three potential Kahooters. All right. Oh, somebody's on an iPad right now. I guess that would work. There must be a Zoom app for the iPad. Yes. I don't know if Jeffrey can connect from an iPad into Kahoot. I'll wait a few seconds and see if that works. It looks like maybe not. Should be able to open a website, but anyway, maybe difficult to open two things at once. All right, well, we'll start. So, four questions. What protocol provides transport but no encryption? It's L2TP, Layer 2 Tunneling Protocol. It makes a tunnel, carries one kind of data in another kind of packet, but it does not add any encryption. All the rest of these do. The encryption varies from one to another, but they all add some encryption. Which one is old and unsafe here? All right, PPTP, the old Microsoft one. All right. Which one runs over 3389? That's Microsoft's RDP. All right. And what's the IM system? It's been around since the 80s. Internet Relay Chat. WAP is a wireless system. All right. Anyway, all right. So Al's the winner. And that's it for Chapter 5. Let's take a look at Chapter 6, which is here, Identity and Access Management. So... You have to authenticate people. Remember, identification is the first step where you claim to be somebody, and authentication is where you prove that with something like a thumbprint or a password. So the type one is the most common and the weakest method, something you know, like a password. Then there is something you have and something you are. Another one that has been added real recently is where you are, being used by a lot of people now that we have location detectors and portable devices. So you can have static passwords or pass phrases or passwords that change either uh, one time or dynamic passwords. Static passwords are the most common type, usually where the user makes up a password. And uh, unfortunately, users frequently make terrible passwords like one, two, three, four, five, six, and things like that. So uh, this is why a lot of people get hacked because it's actually quite easy to guess people's passwords generally. Um, it's a whole lot stronger if you can go to two-factor authentication and combine the password with something else like a thumbprint. Pass phrases are when people try to make a whole sentence. This is a whole lot better than choosing a password. It's harder to guess, although there have been some researchers that find that there really aren't that many sentences people choose, and you can try them all uh, if you get a system where you can try 50 or 100 million guesses, but still it's a lot better than what people choose when you let them choose passwords. One-time passwords are an alternative where you somehow deliver these to people. They have a list of them and cross them off as they use them, or they have some kind of gadget that coughs up the password. It's quite secure, but you have a distribution problem. It's difficult to get it to the end user. Dynamic passwords are these RSA tokens where it just changes on some periodic basis, like every 30 seconds. So you type in your password, then it asks you for your secure ID number, and you type that in. Uh, 
These are used by big insurance companies and uh, military contractors and lots of people. They're trusted very much, although the Chinese did hack them and steal the master key a few years ago, or so the rumor goes. We know they got hacked, and they never quite admitted what happened, but they had to reissue tokens to anyone who would sign a confidentiality agreement not to say what happened. Anyway, um, although they're expensive, they are considered quite secure. And so that gets us in the world of strong authentication, which is also called multi-factor authentication, where you have more than one authentication factor, and it has to be two different types of authentication. Two passwords or a password and a PIN is not two-factor authentication. It has to be two of those things, what you know, what you have, and what you are, two different things. Like an ATM card, which is something you have, and a PIN, which is something you know, is fine, and that's what people often use when they're checking out at the supermarket. That's valid two-factor authentication. If someone steals your card, they don't know your PIN. If someone steals your PIN, they also have to steal your card, and that makes it a lot more work to uh, benefit from a mass breach where you might steal a million passwords or something. <clears throat> As I said, you can often guess passwords. Uh, passwords might be in-system logs. Um, you can have uh, levels, password lockout thresholds, where if someone tries five bad passwords, you lock them out for an hour or something. This is commonly done to stop online brute force attacks with tools like Hydra that will just try thousands of passwords at a login form. The usually, most websites, unless they are ridiculously sloppy, will not let you have try an unlimited number of passwords online. So the way you crack into passwords is you get root on a server and you steal the password storage file. And very old systems used to store passwords in plain text, but these days they store it in the form of a hash, although a great many of them, like Microsoft systems, use very old, weak, insecure hashes. So in fact, you can try enormous lists like billions of passwords in a brief period of time, even on an ordinary home machine. So password hashes are in the ETC shadow file on Unix systems. In Microsoft systems, they're in the registry, which is stored in the SAM file. And um, there are plenty of hacking tools that can recover it from Windows systems. And then you can crack them. So you can, you can snip passwords from network traffic or you can read them from RAM, or you can read the SAM file by booting another operating system or by getting system-level access on a Microsoft system. The old hash system used by Windows XP and earlier versions of Windows was the one here marked LM, about a little more than halfway down. That was the LAN manager password, and you can see it is the shortest hash on the list. So the password lowercase p-a-s-s-w-o-r-d appears here on the left and the lm hash is e52ca and so on and if you change the lowercase p to a capital p the lm hash remains the same because it was so it's an extremely weak system that among other things it changed all lowercase letters to uppercase letters before hashing them it broke your password up into two fields each of them no longer than seven characters and it was just so extremely weak that for decades, it's been quite easy to recover passwords from these hashes. So Microsoft finally quit using them in starting with Vista. You can still use them in a modern version of Windows, but you would have to go to the effort of turning on this feature. They're no longer used by default. They switched to the NT password, which you can see below the LM in this list, which is twice as long and much more secure than what Microsoft used to use, although millions of times weaker than what's used on Linux and Mac systems. So a dictionary attack is how you generally do really crack passwords. You get a list of stolen uh, passwords from previous breaches. There are now available for free lists of billions of real passwords stolen in previous breaches. And almost everybody is using a password that somebody else used before. So if you can try a few billion guesses, you can get in. Um, you can try to prevent this by having password complexity and linked rules, which will try to make it more difficult for people to use words in an ordinary English dictionary. But the words they will choose are almost always in the password cracking dictionaries. So a brute force attack is where you try all possible combinations of characters. Uh, that's slow, but it can be sped up by using graphical processing units. In the days of LM hashes, it was practical to use rainbow tables, 
the number of combinations was so small that you could store a list of mathematical calculations in RAM and use lookup processes instead of calculating the hashes. And that's why there were hash cracking tools from Loft Heavy Industries, one of them was called OffCrack, that would just try all possible LM hashes in just a few minutes. Uh, with modern hash algorithms, you get less benefit from rainbow tables, but it still works pretty well on Microsoft passwords because they don't salt them. Uh, another attack is a hybrid attack where you start with a dictionary and then modify the words like changing letters to numbers, changing a few letters to uppercase to get variations on words because that's what a lot of people use for passwords is a normal dictionary word with a minor misspelling or spelling alteration. Salts are used to defeat rainbow tables. Uh, if two people choose the same password in Windows, they get exactly the same hash. So there are online dictionaries on the internet of Microsoft hashes, and if you have a Microsoft password hash, you can often crack it just by Googling it, because Microsoft has never updated their password hashing algorithm since 1993, and in all these decades, everybody's been accumulating information about their hashes. But on a Linux or Mac system, this wouldn't work because if you have a password, eight characters of random characters are added to it before it's hashed. So even if two people on your system have the same password, they have totally different hashes, and you can't make one master lookup table to find the password. You really have to go to the bother of calculating the password for your whole dictionary of guesses to crack each one. So it slows you down by a lot. Microsoft has some password policy settings in attempting to make passwords more secure. Most of these are of very little value. Uh, password history and password age are used to force people to change their password when the age passes. And you have password history and minimum password age to prevent them from just changing the password and then changing it back. So with this system, you can only change your password once every two days, and you can't use any of your last 24 passwords, so it would take more than a month to get back to your old password, so this forces people to change them. About a year ago, a report came out from research saying that forcing people to change their passwords seems to accomplish nothing. It really doesn't make any sense if you think about threat modeling. Um, if you force people to change their passwords, say, every six months, what exactly do you think that bought you? If they lost their password, the bad guys can only log in for six months before it gets changed. How is that really helping anybody? And studies suggest that it really isn't. But anyway, it was believed in in the time when Microsoft set these up. Their complexity requirements and length requirements were intended to prevent you from choosing English dictionary words. The complexity requirement forces you to have uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. You must have at least three of those. But in practice, it doesn't accomplish much because the list of stolen passwords has most of the common words people create with that system. Storing passwords with reversible encryption is the worst thing to do here, and that's been turned off in all Windows systems, I think, since Windows 95 or DOS a very long time. Uh, that was where passwords were stored effectively in plain text with a key where you could just decrypt them instead of being hashed. Uh, and that has been off by default for a long time. If you do turn that on, then your system security is greatly lowered. So users often write down passwords and put them somewhere like under the keyboard or on the monitor. Uh, that's not a good idea at all, I must say. In practice, I think one of the best things to tell non-tactical people to do with their passwords is write it down on paper and put it wherever they keep their $100 bills. But I haven't seen that in CISSP textbooks. I'm not sure that they would accept that answer as correct on the exam. But I think in the real world, that's a correct answer because people do have ways of keeping pieces of paper secure. But if you don't put it where you put your $100 bills, then of course it's not a good idea. Anyway, type two authentication is something you have. So you have a card or something you carry around like those RSA secure IDs, or you put an app on your phone like Google Authenticator, or you have a text message sent to your phone and it relies upon you having your phone. So there are synchronous dynamic tokens that just change according to a clock and its numbers look random, but they're predictable and the server is predicting them. So the server knows what numbers should be appearing on your device. There are asynchronous dynamic tokens that I think are far less popular where you have to type in some number that you see on the website and get an answer, but it's another way to do it. In both cases, you're carrying some kind of gadget 
which has an algorithm to create pseudo random numbers and the server has the same algorithm and the same seed so it can reproduce those numbers. And something you are. Uh, these are biometrics. The most common is fingerprints. It's the cheapest and easiest. Um, so the two ways to rate a biometric system, uh, there are two time factors that matter. One is how long it takes to register systems, uh, to register a new user, and the other is how long it takes to use once you're registered. And in practice, people want the registration to take no more than two minutes and the authentication to take no more than 10 seconds. Otherwise, this system becomes very unpleasant and people don't like it. There's the way biometric systems are rated. There is a sensitivity control on the bottom here. If you turn the sensitivity up, then you prevent the false accept rate. A false accept rate is when an unauthorized person is approved and let in. A false reject rate, however, is when your authorized users are not let in. And if you turn the sensitivity up, you reject more of the authorized users and irritate them. Uh, so a so measure of the actual quality of the device is the crossover error rate. The point at which these two cross, if you have a better device, it has a lower crossover error rate. All right, so fingerprints are the most common. They do not actually store a photograph of your fingerprint typically. What they do is uh, extract points, like the, the circled things here, places where lines converge. They call those minutiae, and they store some number of minutiae in some digital form. So that one thing people like to say is that even if someone was to hack into something like your iPhone and steal its image of your fingerprint, they wouldn't be able to totally forge your fingerprint from that. I'm not aware of any research testing to see how accurate that is, but that is the idea. One big concern with biometrics is you can't change them. And uh, if someone was able to steal your fingerprints, then they would be able to imitate you and there's no way you can change your password anymore. So that's one fundamental weakness of the system. Retina scan is supposed to be much more secure, but it requires you to stick your chin in a cup and your eye in an eye socket, and people are just reluctant to do that. They don't feel like it's sanitary, it's not popular, so most people are not really willing to put up with it, although from a purely mathematical and biological point of view, it's probably the most accurate biometric. An iris scan would be much better. An iris scan takes... Uh, and it just takes a photograph of your face, and all it has to be is a high-resolution photograph. You don't have to be terribly close to the camera. And it looks at the colored part of your eye, which has a set of rings and striations and dots and a uh, shape sort of like a fingerprint that's unique to each person. And uh, these things are now being put in airports so they can just take pictures of everybody as they go by with high precision. And the idea is they can see if you're on the do not fly list when you're just walking around the airport. Um, these are quite popular as cameras have really gotten very good and they can do this from a distance. But they're still not commonly in use on consumer devices because they're more expensive than fingerprint readers. Hand geometry is another one. You put your hand in a little frame that holds it about four inches above an infrared reader and it measures the pattern of veins, I think, in your hand. I don't think it's measuring the bones, although it could. I think it's measuring the veins. But anyway, it measures something about the geometry of your hand. Another one is keyboard dynamics. Since you are typing on a website anyway to log in typically, they could measure how long you hold each key press down and how, what the distance is, between, the temporal distance between one key press and the next, and that would be a measure of your biometrics, say dynamic biometric measurement. This is uh, cheap to implement because you don't have to buy any new hardware, but I'm not aware of any large scale systems that actually use it. Dynamic signature is another one. You get someone to type in with an electronic, to sign something with a pen, and then you measure something about the motion of their hand, trying to determine if it's really the authorized user or not. Voice print is popular in science fiction, not very popular in the real world. It sounds good, and the humans are very good at recognizing voices, but computers are not very good at recognizing voices at all. They tend not to... Uh, be able to identify people correctly. They tend to be fooled by people with a cold and so on. So these things are not as common as all the science fiction creators thought they would become.
although computers are now very good at actually understanding spoken words. And we have all these telephone systems where you say, say yes for this and so on. So perhaps these voice prints are coming soon as our computer systems are actually getting pretty good at understanding human speech now. Then there's facial scans. This is uh, probably for law enforcement, the Holy Grail, where they just take a photograph of you as you walk by or a mug shot or the picture on your driver's license and they recognize you the way people do. Uh, they really like to do this and uh, people have been trying to do this for the last uh, decade and a half or so uh, with increasing success. This is probably gonna become the standard. All right, then there's uh, taking someplace you are. This is nice because it can be collected effortlessly without the user having to carry around an RSA token or anything. You just let them log in and then you look at their IP address or if they're using a phone or something, they might have a GPS unit and you see where they are. And if they are trying, for example, to make a purchase at a store, you see if the device making the purchase is in fact physically in that store. And if it's not, then it's some hacker that stole their password. And if it is in the store, then it's uh, the second factor of authentication for them. So that's a pretty good idea if it works. Uh, the another side benefit of this is people really want to track who is entering the store to target ads. That's an all the rage these days. So I've got some boots about that. Let me close this old Kahoot tab. And this is 6A, okay. All right, and we have three potential Kahooters. Although we only got two last time, I think the person on an iPad may not be able to use Kahoot. Although in principle, you could just open another browser tab and go there, but perhaps it's not practical on your device, I don't know. Probably, aha, I figured out how to get in, good. I think my students have told me there's actually a Kahoot app. Might be good for that case. Anyway, I haven't tried it. Five questions. So what would you add to a password to make two-factor authentication? All right, well, the IP address is the only right answer. A PIN does not make two-factor authentication. A PIN is just a number you know. So it's just like another password. You have to have something that is not something you know, and that would be your IP address. Having your geolocation from the IP address and your password would make two-factor authentication. All right, where do you find the password hashes on Unix? All right, they're in the shadow file. Long ago, they were in the password file, but ever since the 70s, they were moved to the shadow file. The SAM file is where they are on Windows. SAM and system are Windows registry files and do not appear on Linux or Unix. All right, what will stop an online brute force attack? Okay, password block, uh, uh, lockout thresholds will do it. An online brute force attack is where people are trying to log in thousands of times online and you just lock them out after some number of failed logins. What's the weakest password hash type? Okay, it's Microsoft's old system LM. That was so weak, even Microsoft abandoned it and upgraded to the NTLM which is also appallingly weak, but it is better than the old LM system. All right. What's the biometric system that will let unauthorized people pass? That's it, a high false accept rate. That means it has a high chance of letting someone through who is not in fact the right person. Okay, so Al's the winner again. And we're up to the last section. We're fitting in the time nicely this time, as this is a short chapter. All right, so then we can talk about the technology that controls access. Once you've decided that you know who somebody is because they've authenticated, now you decide how to limit what they can do. 
Um, if you have just a bunch of Windows machines that are not in a domain, then you have to adjust the permissions on every machine, and that turns out to be a terrible mess. Very soon you lose control as employees come and go and you add more machines. What you really need is a centralized place to control access, and that's why people use domain controllers. And another thing you can do is provide single sign-on, so after logging in once in the morning, they can access all the company servers they need to access without having to log in again, because the original authentication is stored and trusted across all these computers. And what you want is a central system that provides the AAA services, authentication, authorization, and accounting. Those date from the days of the... Uh, early voice telephone network, you want to know who people are, you want them to prove it, you want to know what they are allowed to do, that's the authorization, and you want to keep a log of what they do so you can bill them for the calls later and so that you can investigate security breaches if somebody does something they shouldn't have done. Decentralized access control is a possible way to do it where you let every branch location of your company make local decisions about access control. This makes it possible for your branch offices to do what they have to do more, but it does have a risk that certain branch offices might have poor security policies. Discretionary access control is called DAC, not decentralized access control. And discretionary access control, which we talked about in earlier chapters, is where every device has an owner, and the owner can do anything they want with this. And this is typically appropriate only for home users, where they own a laptop, and they don't have to ask anybody's permission to do anything with that laptop. At work, most people don't want to have this system. There ought to be some kind of control, like the, uh, the company policies and the domain controller limiting what you can do with company assets. So single sign-on is essential for computing systems of any size. You have to somehow log in in one case and then have that login reused as necessary to get you to all the systems you connect to. This does mean that it creates a high value asset where that authentication takes place and people have, uh, hackers may steal all the authentication tokens there. It also means um, that if they compromise a desktop and get something like a Windows password hash, they can now impersonate that user and get in other systems, but almost everyone regards this as an acceptable risk for the convenience of single sign-on, so people don't have to keep logging in multiple times throughout the day. So there should be two-factor authentication for single sign-on. That would be much better, um, but an attacker might hijack an authenticated session. If a user logs in, and then they're surfing the web, and then you trick them into downloading malware, the attacker is now in their browser that is already logged in and has certain privileges on the network. So it is a problem. Um, one thing you might do is prevent, is have locking screen savers and session timeouts, so at least this doesn't happen when users aren't there, so they aren't walking away from the desk and having someone physically use the workstation, but that doesn't really address the issue of malware they get on the web. Anyway, there's a uh, life cycle for access provision. I remember at my college, when I sent a lot of students to have password resets on the Unix system, somebody just made me the administrator of the Unix system so I could do password resets when I knew only like five Unix commands. But there wasn't much in the way of any authority making intelligent decisions about this stuff. And uh, most companies would like to improve their security beyond that. There ought to be some control over people's access. So you, you notify users when their passwords are going to expire. Uh, you have rules when people go on vacation, their account may go inactive, or if their account is unused, they lose their access rights. If you have visitors, like uh, subcontractors that come in, their access rights should be removed when they leave, and so on when you fire people or you promote them, or move them to another location. You should adjust their access rights so that they can no longer get into the systems they don't need anymore. Otherwise, of course, you've got people going in the wrong place. Uh, this is extremely common, that a network administrator is disgruntled and gets fired, and they don't cancel their credentials quickly enough, and that administrator hacks back into the company, um, now using credentials that are still treated as valid. I was the network administrator at a financial company, and they had they fired people rather frequently, and they would call them to take a long walk to the back room to talk to the boss, and while they were taking that walk, they would call me and have me freeze their account. 
so that they found out they were fired and they were already locked out so they couldn't do any harm. And that's a pretty good policy. Anyway, um, all right. So you have uh, access aggregation is what happens if people get access to one system and another system and another system because as they get promoted and move to one role to another through the company, you don't remove their old access. And that's authorization creep also. Uh, this can defeat nice controls like least privilege and separation of duties. So these permissions should be audited. You should have a permission review and an, a, a high privilege account review to see what people are doing with their privileges. Or you may have uh, undetected situations where someone has more rights than they should have and they're doing something wrong and it'll go on for a long time before they get caught. I know a famous case happened to Pacific Bell. The network administrators at our local phone company had a special server all full of pirated movies and music that they were sharing among themselves for years before anyone in management found out about it. Anyway, federated identity management is the next step beyond single sign-on. So what happens if you have business partners? For example, Microsoft has employees and they have an ad. Of course, they have a Windows domain that they're logging into, but their checks are printed by Ross Perot's company. Uh, with one down in Texas, I've forgotten the name of it right now, but they have a they print almost everybody's checks and they also put out the tax returns. So Microsoft employees have to have a second login for that other financial company to get their tax returns. And Microsoft solved this by putting a federated identity management server inside that other company so their Microsoft domain login would be accepted by the check printing company as their credentials so they could get their tax returns. And that's called federated identity management. And some people would like to relieve us from having to remember dozens of different passwords or the unsafe practice of reusing passwords by having some large federated identity management out there. In practice, almost every website now lets you log in with a Facebook login or a Twitter login. So Facebook seems to have been accepted by the uh, internet at large as the ultimate authority of, of credentials. You may remember Obama wanted to do this in 2011. He said it was a burden for people to remember all the passwords and the US government was going to declare a federal identity and you would use it to log into everything. This was one of several ideas Obama proposed that just fell like a lead balloon. Everyone said, are you out of your mind? That's a terrible idea and it never happened. But for a week or so, it was all over the news, um, inspiring many people to get upset about it. Uh, so SAML is a language used to exchange security information over a network. Like you might have logged in with administrative privileges, and this is the language that will be used to send that information to the server saying, this guy has administrative privileges. It's an XML-based framework that moves information about your privileges, um, including authentication data, and this lets you have internet-scale single sign-on. Systems that speak SAML can be told to trust this guy, I already verified his credentials or hers. Uh, then there's identity as a service. Um, this is like what Obama proposed and like what Facebook has effectively done is you have someplace you go to log in to prove who you are and now you use other sites and they all believe they know who you are because they trust that third party. Microsoft has tried to sell services to do this several times, but somehow they never became popular. What really became popular was uh, Facebook for some reason. Uh, all right, so there are credential management systems. This is a very good thing for most users to use a password manager like 1Password or LastPass or RoboForm on your computer, even though this creates a target and sometimes they have breaches and get hacked, most people are much better off using them because it stops them from reusing the same password over and over at many sites, which is a really bad practice because people get hacked so much and lose the passwords. So um, it's a good idea to have two-factor authentication to unlock their credentials and to log what happens. But um, these are very handy. I remember I switched to one a few years ago and it makes your online life easier and a lot more secure. All right, if you have a third-party identity service, you could host your own inside your company or you could have one outside um, and then Application could integrate with a cloud identity. Anyway, now you've got directory information to move across a network. Um, 
And this is done with lightweight directory access protocol. That's what Microsoft uses for Active Directory to have information like a user profile about you sent over the network when you log in. It uses port 389. It can be done with plain text or with encrypted transmissions. Kerberos is an authentication system that's also used by Microsoft, uh, Active Directory domains. This, the whole point of Kerberos was to prevent people from sending passwords unencrypted over the network, which is how really early systems worked. Kerberos, instead of sending your password over the network, has a thing called a ticket granting service. And after you log in, you apply for a ticket, which gives you permission to access a resource for a limited period of time, usually 10 hours. And then the next time you log in, you get a different ticket. And those tickets are created in a apparently random fashion. They are constructed to some extent from your password, but it is difficult to recover the password from a ticket. It's very much like reversing a hash. There are hacking tools that do it, and I've used them, but they're not enormously effective in modern versions. It's pretty good. Um, so Kerberos has a client trying to connect. A realm is the network. You have a ticket that authenticates you, and you have credentials to get your ticket. And then you have a key distribution center and a ticket granting service. And you even have a ticket granting ticket where you have a ticket that gives you a chance to get another ticket. It's kind of complicated, but of course for a CISSP exam, you don't really have to understand the details of how it works. You just have to know sort of the most popular terms associated with it so you can recognize it. Uh, as I've said before, the CISSP is famous for being a mile wide and an inch deep. So Alice contacts the key distribution center in Kerberos. They then send you a session key encrypted with Alice's secret key and a ticket granting ticket. So now Alice can use that to go to the ticket granting service and get a ticket, which is her session key, which will then let her use something like a printer for some period of time. Default is 10 hours. All right, here's a graphical diagram of all that stuff going by. One thing about Kerberos is all the clocks on all the servers have to be synchronized within five minutes or it won't work because your ticket only works for a certain period of time. And if the clock is off by more than that, then your ticket will not be valid when you try to use the device. So it's an issue here. And this is why if you take Microsoft server certification, they always make a big deal of saying you must configure a network time protocol on every server and make sure all your servers have synchronized clocks or a whole lot of Microsoft's Active Directory stuff will not work properly. So the key distribution center has all the keys, so it is a single target to attack uh, to seal them all. There are single points of failure in the network if you have only one key distribution center and ticket granting uh, server. You can replay tickets, which is the general problem with all single sign-ons, there is ultimately something that is sent over the network to prove who you are, and a hacker can steal that and impersonate you for a period of time. Um, and there was a weakness in Kerberos 4 that they fixed in Kerberos 5 where you could find out something about someone else's password. And of course, the keys are stored in your RAM in plain text, which is really a shame. Target credit card numbers are stolen from RAM, and my students steal passwords from RAM in all my classes at various levels for homework, and this is entirely unnecessary. I think since 2004, Microsoft's um, development system, Visual Studio, has had a special variable type for secure data that would not linger in RAM, but be held in there only for a fraction of a second and removed when you don't need it anymore, but the developers just don't use it. They use ordinary regular variables to store sensitive data in RAM, so it just persists in RAM until you shut down the machine and people do steal it. It's a shame. Hopefully one of these days there'll be an improvement there. Sesame is a European system to do this. It's their competitor for Kerberos. It's got public key encryption and that avoids Kerberos' plain text storage of symmetric keys although I haven't heard of people using it in America. I'm not quite sure what systems in Europe use it, but apparently some of them do. Radius and diameter are commonly used for um, authentication of users that connect from a distance. Radius was the original one. It's so old that dial-in is part of the name. It was intended to run over 56K dial-in connections, although you can use it for modern fast connections also. 
these are AAA servers, um, and trip, uh, Radius was considered less secure from using UDP. Uh, diameter uses TCP. TACAX and TACAX Plus are Cisco's system. TACAX Plus is the newer one. This is used by Cisco VPN concentrators. It encrypts all data and is popular with people that buy Cisco devices. Then you have to install Cisco client software on them and they connect this way. PAP was the very early system used to send passwords over the network where you just send passwords in plain text over the wire. That's, of course, a terrible idea now that you're sending it over the internet, which is a shared network, so a lot of people can see the packets. So the first step up was CHAP, where the server sends you a challenge, which will be a few random letters. You add those letters to your password and hash it and send it up to the server. Now, the thing that goes over the wire proves that you know the password, but it's not equal to the password. And if your hashing system was secure enough and the challenge was long enough, it would be difficult for an attacker to break. Uh, Microsoft Active Directory groups users into domains and uses Kerberos. You can now have trust relationships between domains. If you, as a sub-portion of your company or a uh, business partner can have some privileges there, and you can make these trusts, transitive or non-transitive, that say, I am Microsoft and I trust Cisco. And then the transitive issue is, if Cisco now touch, trusts AOL, do you trust AOL as Microsoft just because Cisco does? And that would be a transitive trust if you accept a friend of a friend and non-transitive if you don't accept the friend of a friend. And this is why Microsoft makes so much money and Active Directory is so important because they are the only server network that can really handle a common business situation for large companies. Like you are a giant multinational company and now you buy another whole company, which also has thousands of servers all over the place, and you want to integrate them into your new company with control over exactly how much you trust each part of that. And Active Directory domains have all the tools you need to do that, and there is nobody else in that space giving you any of the software you need to handle the complicated trust relationships for things like buyouts and mergers and splitting of companies. All right. So here's the access control models. These are the three main models. Discretionary access control is the weakest. Mandatory access control is the strongest. And there are other ones they call non-discretionary. There's a variety of them. So discretionary is what you have for home users. You have a laptop. You have a cell phone. It is not controlled by a boss or anybody. You can do anything you want with it. You can put any kind of data on it. You can share that data with anybody else. You can give your password to somebody else. You know you're the owner, and you can do whatever you want. This is appropriate at home and obviously not appropriate at work. In the military, you have mandatory access control, which is the most cumbersome and expensive, but hopefully the most secure. Uh, everybody has clearance, objects are labeled, things like confidential, secret, and top secret, and you can't move anything from one level to another without going through a clearance process and having people above you approve things. So very frequently, you want to get at something, but you're not cleared for it, and you have to wait for a cumbersome process to get cleared. That's what makes it expensive, but it is considered safe enough to protect military secrets, of course. Um, all right, the most common type is actually role-based access control. This is what companies actually use with Active Directory domains, which is the sweet spot in the middle of those two extremes. And uh, this is where you sort people into categories. So you have sort them into basic user, auditor, network engineer, help desk, and everything else. And then you, once you put them in a category, that category says what they can do and what they can't do. This way, you just put people in the right category when you hire them, and when you fire them or promote them, you lift them out of one category and put them in another, and this is what most people find is practical enough to move on, role-based access control. You could also have task-based access control, which is almost the same thing just with a different terminology where you determine your tasks, and then you get certain rights to do your task. Um, then there's rule-based access control, which is sort of the logical extension of this to things like a firewall rule, where traffic going in this direction is allowed to use this port, but not that port. You can just have any series of if-then rules. And this would also be appropriate for things like parental controls, where children can only play games for two hours a day. They can only go to G-rated websites, but not R-rated websites. It's just a series of logical rules. Um, all right. 
There's content dependent access control where you have additional criteria beyond identification and authorization, such as you're allowed to see your own HR data, but not another user's HR data. It's not as simple as saying at a certain clearance, you can see the data in HR and below that clearance, you can't see any of the data. Here, there's another horizontal control in addition to the vertical control. And then there's context dependent access controls, such as the time of day, one common security feature is to take your low-level staff and only allow them to log in during normal business hours, plus maybe two hours for a little bit of overtime. And that way, if someone steals their credentials and tries to come in at midnight, they can't because they're not approved to log in at midnight. All right, got some cahoots about that stuff. Get rid of this one. And this is 6B, all right. Good, right on time. We're just about at an hour. This will finish today's lesson. Oh, I'm running out of power. Anyway, I'll plug this thing in. All you people join the Kahoot. All right. All right. I think three is the number. Three is indeed the number. Okay. Five questions. So what system accepts an identity from a different organization? That's FIM, Federated Identity Management. You trust somebody else's statement about who this person is. All right. Which one runs on UDP 389? Okay, that is LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, used to move user profiles around on Windows systems. What's a TGT lifetime? That's Kerberos, ticket granting tickets. They make it 10 hours, intending to be a normal working day, plus a little bit of extra. All right, what's the European improvement on Kerberos? Indeed, Sesame, all right. And what's the system used on a home Windows laptop? That's discretionary access control. Everything is up to you. So Al is the winner every time today. Very good. All right. Uh, if you've got any questions, send me a chat. Uh, we are here. We just did this. There's only three more classes. And next time we'll do seven and a little bit of eight because seven is short, but eight is long. Uh, and I got a quiz up for it. So you can do those quizzes if you like. I certainly can't make you do them because this is a non-credit course and you don't get a grade, but that's my recommendation. All right, looks like there are no comments. Ah, oh, here comes one. Time to go stand out, <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, he's got to go shopping. Uh, good luck with that, okay. All right, I'm gonna shut it down, folks. Have a good night, I'll see you next week.